Yes, friends. Uh, welcome into the End Time Church. You are the End Time Church. And so are we, because we believe. Amen. Hallelujah. That is the almighty Tyrannosaurus uh, girding up the operation, the foundation, as usual. Uh, otherwise, we're all falling down. Oh, uh, she's carrying all of us tonight. In, indeed. <laughs> like a mother, actually. Uh, the mom, End Time Church. Congratulations, Taryn. Uh, your mother, um, <laughs> Pastor <Wow>. Anderson. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm excited. That's all it is. Christopher Anderson is here, along for the ride as always, brother. Welcome. Your shirt matches your beautiful eyes. It's wonderful that you're wearing that. Do you know who you look like? Did you know? I think if anybody watches pro football and you know Derek Carr for the Raiders, the quarterback, I think you got a little Derek Carr going on. I'm probably just as talented as he is, too. Uh, at least, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh oh man! My next comment, yeah. Um, he got the court, current quarterback, right? He's previous. Correct. Yes, he beat the Eagles senseless yesterday. Oh, okay. Oh, maybe not current, but <laughs> I'm not that talented. He's pretty good. Well, when he was five, you might have been as talented as that. Yeah, you know, it doesn't um, speak much beating the Eagles these days, but it doesn't. Still. It doesn't take a lot actually at all. Uh, praise God, because they're not the most important thing in the world. The Lord is. And uh, and you guys are important, and we honor you for being here, and thank you, and we love you, and uh, say hello where you're from, who you are, and where you're watching. Hopefully, you're on the End Time Dot Church website itself, because that's the place to be. It's super cool and fun, uh, and we are there checking in with you uh, if any questions or comments or whatever come up. We are there, but if you're also on YouTube or uh, Facebook or what have you, go ahead and please just use that medium as well we will get to it at some point probably uh we'll give it our best shot all right nicely put are we doing math tonight no math yeah like mathematics yeah not if i can help it 70 weeks oh right bible math <laughs> yeah uh we can definitely try that because well, math is math right <laughs> math wow. is math Nobody's watched the cartoon. Huh? I don't know about all that. Um, but if I know I like the Bible math because God gives you the answer. Uh, mm. Incredible, yeah. too. Yeah, I don't have to figure it out. So that's very helpful. Thank you, Lord. Okay, as always, just real, real quick, because I don't want to drone on forever. Um, Pastor Anderson, you don't have the list of announcements in front of you, do you? Well, let's just see. Uh, all right. All right. Go. Oh, let's do some announcements. Let's get this thing done. So first off, if you are not currently on our app, highly encourage you guys to get on there. This is where all the cool kids gather every week. This is what we do. We got hundreds of people on here every day, you know, in one room or the other, talking and chatting. This is where the fellowship occurs. Look at that. The slow, steady phone, ah. guys. Yeah. I messed it up. Yeah, look at that. Boom. All y'all are awesome. And what's really cool about it, it's absolutely free. It costs you nothing. Just a little absolutely. bit of time to get on there. And get absolutely it. free? Absolutely. Nice. So it's an app store. Go there. Doesn't matter if you got Android, you got iPhone, you can get it. Second, another really cool and groovy app we got is the prayer app. Pretty cool. It says Prayer Force. It looks like this. Look at that. At all these cool little countries, or, or actually, they're not even countries, they're continents. It is. There's another one. Pick on that. You can send your prayer requests right there, and somebody around the world will see that, will pray with you for whatever that need may be right then and there. So, again, the two apps we're talking about one is called Prayer Force. And the other one is called End Time Church. So definitely check those two things out. Uh, I'm in here right now asking for prayer that Pastor Anderson gets amazing braids. Yes, see. please. Yeah, that would be great. I got a 95 and a half in my last class, and I'm a little disappointed. I should have been perfect. But <laughs> I just, Caribbean's formatting is just kicking my butt. So That's just obnoxious, 95 and a half. It's Very no, extremely I'm obnoxious. It's doctorate level work. I got I got another class that just started today, so I got another chance. Mm -hmm. Right, every day is a new chance. All right, so if you're on the endtime.church website, so right now if you got a prayer request, go on there. There's a little 
tab right next to chat. This is prayer. Check that out. Shoot us a prayer request, and one of us here will get that. We'll pray with you. We'd love to. Next uh, tab there is called Playlists. Click on that, and you can see different messages for, uh, what, all the way back to August 16th, it looks like. So you can yep. get some of those messages. And if you go to the YouTube page, check us out, uh, In Time Church there, you can see, what, three years' worth of messages? All the way. All the way. And then another cool feature on that at the top of the screen on the right hand side, I got to put my fingers up there to figure left from right because I'm still in kindergarten when it comes to that <laughs> button that says give now. So if you feel um, the Lord pressing on your heart to sow into this ministry, if we have been a blessing to you in any way, shape or form, if we have helped you in your walk of faith, please consider giving a love offering or a donation uh, to End Time Church. We take crypto as button. well, by the way. Oh, crypto. Look at that. Yep. So we're, we're moving on up in the world there. So give as the Lord leads you. And that's all we're going to really have to say about giving. So tonight we're starting Daniel chapter 9. Bless the Lord, man. So we are getting there. So Earl Lee, pl please pray for me doing bad. So Earl, if you don't mind, if it's possible, would you be able just to give a little more detail? If not, that's fine. We'll still pray for you. It don't really matter. But just wanted to uh, maybe see any specific way we can pray for you tonight. Yeah, God knows. And matter of fact, anybody else that has any prayer requests out there on YouTube land, Facebook world, or endtime.church, shoot us a message. We're going to pray for whatever we can pray for here in the next few minutes. So you got a couple more minutes to get those prayer requests in tonight. So Mighty T-Rex, how are you doing tonight? Doing well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, tonight's uh, worship will be um, a friend of mine, Sarah Eaton, gave me a song that she would like to see set to music. So I had fun working on that a bit this weekend, um, and then an older hymn. So it's Psalm one twenty two, most of it. Yeah. Pretty cool. Bing. Yeah. Internet approved. <laughs> a, a new, a new end time church form. <laughs> Speaking, of, hey, right. Thank you for yeah. saying that. Why? Me. Yeah. yeah, we've got a form out there that we really, really want you guys input on. Please, if you go to endtime.church slash survey, survey, and I'll post the link as well. Please fill that out, especially if you've been with us for a while. Oh. It's it's really kind of important to at least us as leaders because we need to know. Sometimes we just don't see the forest through the trees. You know what I mean? Um, we just got to know where we need to fill in the gaps, or is there a gap, or you know, are we doing this adequately, or what would you? All that stuff. Just help us out. All right, we want to get a, a family wide. You know what I mean? Like a little kitchen table um, breakdown of where we're at as a body because we are, you know, Chris and I and Taryn and, and leaders who pastor Randy, we feel very, very passionately uh, about fulfilling our duties as a body together. And so we want to be about discipleship. We want to be about um, the things we're supposed to be about and not the extraneous stuff. So <clears throat> just fill that out. Okay. It's no, no frills, no, no must, no fuss, just submit it and, and we're good. And then we'll get a good picture of how we should, if anything needs to be adjusted, something always needs to be adjusted. Anything needs to be changed. Anything needs to, you know, a new direction or what have you. Tell us. That's what it's for. All right. So go hit that survey. Um, and I'll post that there. So we've got that everywhere now. You can see it and do it. Thank you, Taryn. All right. Uh, why don't we get right into prayer, Chris? Uh, anything that you see or, or the Spirit tells you about, let's do it. And then uh, right from that, we'll go to our worship time and then right to the message. Amen. Sounds good. Let's let's do this. So I'm going to put these prayer requests on the screen and I'll pray for these one at a time um, as I see them coming in through the comment section on YouTube and Facebook. So we're going to start off. We're going to pray for Earl. So, Father, we thank you, God, for just gathering us here together, Lord, for this opportunity to, to pray, to worship, to hear your word, God, to gather as a family, a body of believers from across all the world. Lord, tonight I just want to lift up Earl uh, and his prayer request, God. He's uh, 
doing bad, you know what that means, God. You know, you know all the context of that, Lord. So whatever that is, God, I just ask, Lord, that you'd your Holy Spirit would just come and fill the room where he's at right now, God, and that whatever that situation is, that it begin to turn, Lord. For your word declares that what the devil meant for evil, you meant for good, or you can turn for good, God. So we ask, Lord, that whatever this situation is, God, that you would begin to work the good in this situation uh, on behalf of Earl, God. Lord, I just ask uh, tonight that, uh, you know, that he would be encouraged, God, in, in his heart, encouraged in his mind, that whatever it is that he's going through, I know it sometimes he's, these things that we go through can bring us down mentally, God. It can beat us up, Lord, and we can feel completely exhausted and drained from that, Lord. So I just ask tonight that uh, you would just begin to fill him with strength, Lord, in his mind, in his body, and his heart. In Jesus' name. Lord, I just also tonight want to lift up uh, YouTube user uh, Treason, Lord. He's uh, talking about being accepted in a training program in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Lord. So, God, I just ask God, that if this is your will, God, that you would create a way, God. For Lord, we know the word says that that you open doors that no man closes, and you close doors that no man opens, God. So I just ask, God, if this is your will, God, that this training program would be opened up, and it would be a smooth process uh, to get into that. And then, Lord, I just also want to lift up this request as well, God, regarding strong temptation, God. We know that we are tempted when we are drawn and enticed by our flesh, God. So whatever that is, whatever that temptation is in this situation, God, Lord, I pray that your spirit would rise up, Lord. And I pray that um, right now that that flesh in this situation would be crucified in Jesus' name, that it would be mortified, God. If your word tells us to die daily, Lord, it's dying in our flesh, God, that your spirit that you may live through us every day, God. So in this particular situation, Father, I ask God that you, Holy Spirit, would have your way and live in this situation. Lord God, and, and again, I, I come and we, we lift up Malathi in India, uh, looking for a good future and a good husband, God. So right now, in the name of Jesus, God, I ask that you would bring somebody across her path that loves you, that is sold out to you, God, that would be a good fit, a good husband for her, that, and that God, that uh, this family this that you have a plan, this future that you have for her, Lord, and having a family and having a husband, God, that God, that it would be a a family that's sold out for you, Jesus, that the that this individual that would come across her path, however it may be, God, whenever that timing may be, God, that it would be just a divine appointment, God, and that she will know that. There'll be no question with it in Jesus' name. And Lord, tonight, uh, just want to lift up in this situation, Lord, as well, and, and many that are similar to this, God, um, those of us who have family members who are unbelieving, God. So, Lord, I just want to, Lord, I just want to pray specifically in this particular situation that you would make a Canadian girl, God, and that you make her a witness, Lord God, that you would give her increased boldness, just as Peter prayed for increased boldness after he was released from prison to preach the gospel in spite of being persecuted, God, I would ask for that increased boldness in Canadian girl's life as well, God, that she would declare the gospel of Jesus Christ, no other but your gospel, Lord, to all her family, to her friends, and the people that are around her, God. And I ask, Lord, that you would soften their hearts so they would receive the gospel message, Lord, and that uh, they would come to faith in you. Lord, we know that your will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance, God. And we just pray in this situation for Canadian girl's family, that she would be a light on a hill to them, that her life would be salt to them, that they would taste and hunger and thirst for you because of her example, because of her life, and because of her testimony. Lord, I also want to lift up Mary G and the addiction that she might be facing, and that she says, you know, the, the temptation to that, to be drawn back into it. Lord, a temptation or addiction rather is a, is a stronghold, Lord, as you know, in people's life. So whatever that addiction is, whatever that stronghold is, God, in the name of Jesus, we come against it and we speak the blood of Jesus over the situation. Right now, we, we smash that stronghold right now with the word of God and with your blood, Jesus, for your blood speaks a better word in this situation. We know, God, that no weapon formed against this shall prosper. And so in the name of Jesus, whatever this addiction is, Lord, we may it come to nothing. Lord, may it not prosper in Mary's life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Lord. Lord, I just want to lift up, even in this situation, prayers for the body of Christ and the peace of Jerusalem, God. You say that... Uh, you know, praying for the peace of Jerusalem, and you know, that those are, they're blessed who do that, God. And so, Lord, we just pray for the peace of Jerusalem right now. We pray 
God, for the Jewish people, God, but we also pray for the body of Christ around the world, God. We lift up, even now with a collective group of people that are here, Father, from all across the world, God, we lift up the body of Christ wherever they are at, wherever they are represented, even here in this group, God. Lord, that we would humble ourselves under your mighty hand, that, that you may be exalted, God. May we become less, that you may become more, God. Lord, in this time, in this season, in this Christian culture, in the West specifically of selfish Christianity, God, may we be demonstrators, the true body of Christ of selfless Christianity, of humbled Christianity, God. May your body of Christ no longer be divided, God, but may we come together, God, as a unified body, God. For we're all are different parts, but we're of the same body, God. May we come together, God, in peace, uh, for victory, God, to declare the kingdom of God in this earth, God. For we know, Lord, that you cannot return. You won't return until the gospel of the kingdom has been preached to all nations, Lord. And so may we, as the body of Christ, come to that reality, God. May we put aside our differences. May we be unified, God, in your spirit, in the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' mighty name, God. And right now, Lord, it's runaway rose, praying for forgiveness for the nations. Lord, may we release forgiveness, God, for, for unforgiveness, God, is the root of bitterness. And bitterness is, is built in there. Many sicknesses and many demonic activities, even in the nations and amongst the people, are because of unforgiveness, God. And may we learn, Lord, forgiveness and maybe release forgiveness. Even those here tonight that may be harboring unforgiveness in their heart, either towards themselves or to the somebody else, God, or some situation, God. May we release forgiveness, God. May we learn to release it. For you said, God, if you have unforgiveness in your heart, to leave your gifts at the, at the altar and go and make it right with our brothers. That's what you say, Jesus. You said, if we can't forgive others of our sins, how will the Father forgive us of our sins, God? So we pray, God, for an awakening and awareness of any unforgiveness in our lives, God, that we may release that forgiveness in the name of Jesus to whomever and whatever might have caused offense, including our own selves, God. For so often, Lord, it's hard for us to forgive our own selves, but help us begin to release that in Jesus' name. And Lord, coming from the End Time Church page, I just want to lift up uh, Susanna. Susie in Ireland, Lord, that she's she's closing on our house this week and moving uh, and doing some 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 shuffling around of her living arrangements, God. And so I just pray in the name of Jesus, God, that this thing, this transition would go smoothly, God, that this time of transition would be uh, peaceful, as peaceful as possible, God, and that your your spirit and your peace would reside over this and whatever happens from this point forward. Lord, I thank you, God, so much. For all you are doing, Lord, you are an incredible God, Lord. We lift you up tonight, God, as a collective voice, as a collective body of believers across the world right now, wherever we're at, God. We just lift you up. We praise you. We bless your name, God, for you are worthy of all praise. And Lord, may you increase and may we decrease every day. In Jesus' mighty name. And Holy Spirit, have your way tonight. Amen.
All right, friends. Let's get into it. <clears throat> bless, bless you, God. Thank you for the wondrous servants that you've collected here and for the patience to see it through. We love you. Deliver a word tonight in Jesus' name because we need you to speak. All right, friends, let's do this. Let's pray uh, continually that um, this weather that we're having continues to stay where it is, uh, which is behaving itself. Potentially, we could get knocked off at some point tonight. I don't hope not, but we're going to get to it one way or the other. And if that happens, we'll get to the message um, somehow in some way. All right. So let us share notes tonight. We'll get going. Daniel chapter nine is, if you're a prophecy student, this is kind of the beginning of the road. Um, and the reason for that is pretty clear. Um, is it because Jesus said so, right? <laughs> the Lord just said to look at it. So let's do that now. If technology works for us. Here we are. All right, Daniel chapter 9. Of course, we've done every verse of Daniel so far. We've done every chapter uh, of the book uh, here at ETC um, since, I don't know what, what was it, August or something? Um, here and there, where we've touched on every chapter so far, and we're going to go to the end uh, of the book. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue on now with chapter 9. And again, why do we need to? Do this first of all. Somebody made a comment like, "Why am I calling this the master prophecy? Why? What? What's up with that?" Well, because it is. I mean, this is like, like the master key, right? It, you're going to unlock everything else uh, from this point. Um, this is the beginning, and let the reader understand. Indeed. All right. So, why do we want to go here as the starting point? Um. Well, let's check it out. Therefore, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, told you this, Matthew 24, 15 to 21. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world. Until this time, no, nor ever shall be. It's the words of your Savior, Jesus. I pray he is your Messiah and your God because he's telling us the future. When you see this spoken by Daniel, standing in the holy place, understand, you reader. All right, so as we go through chapter 9, we're going to see two distinct uh, portions. First and foremost, Daniel's prayer in verses 1 through 19. And then from 20 to 27, the very famous... Uh, 70 weeks prophecy. Um, what we need to understand, we're reading in any of it, and it's pretty clear once you see the text, but understand and remember that the great topic of both parts of this chapter 9 is Jerusalem, the city, and its temple. The temple of God. The one that was stood at one time and will stand again. And this chapter will tell you that it must stand again. This is the great topic of both sections. Okay, so let's get to the first part one. Daniel's prayer, starting in 
Uh, verse 1, let's just bring up the text if we can. That would be the easiest thing to do. So let's share that. Or not. I may just have to read the thing. Can you believe it? Let's go to the New King James Version. Um, we're going to be switching up versions a little bit, um, depending on the verse, because some are clearer than others. Some are better than others, to be honest with you. Um, and that is okay. Well, we're not hung up about that stuff. Someone always seems to be, but that's all right. Daniel 9, verse 1, and it reads thusly. On your screen now. Okay. First and foremost, again, we have Daniel's prayer, part one. In the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. We should know that means Babylon, right? The realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. What is that? What is that about? What is that saying? Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12, Jeremiah 29, 10. Um, tell you what the deal is. God tells Jeremiah there uh, in those places that, yes, because of the sin of Israel, there will be um, a deportation. Right, The king of Babylon will come in and take you away. He will defeat you in battle. He will defeat the stronghold of Jerusalem itself. He will destroy the temple, and he will take you into exile, and it will last for 70 years. So I will not make a full end uh, of the nation. There will be a remnant that survives. This is a consistent um, message not only in this prophecy, but every prophecy, basically, uh, that concerns the coming of Jesus, is that whether we're talking about the church, the Gentile church, or the Jewish people, Israel ethnically, there will always be a surviving remnant because God will make sure of it. So there's no um, purpose, there's no reason to want anything more than that, right? Like a rapture, God will provide that remnant all we have to decide is where we follow him so for example jeremiah 29 10 this is what the lord says you will be in babylon for 70 years but then i will come and do for you all the good things that i have promised and i will bring you home again for i know the plans that i have for you famous line that no one has the context for usually i know the plans i have for you says the lord they are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope in those days when you pray i will listen and if you look for me wholeheartedly i will or you will find me i will be found by you says the lord i will end your captivity and restore your fortunes okay so there it is what daniel is saying is i fi finally figured this out 70 years desolation of Jerusalem. And that's what we're looking forward to, isn't it? Because Jesus mentioned that word desolation. Um, and it has to do with the temple of God, because it says in the holy place, we're going to establish that. Then verse three, then I set my face towards the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting sackcloth and ashes. Then, so after he understood what was written in Jeremiah, in the prophecy, right? Then he went to seek God's face with fasting and mourning. This is applicable to you and me. What, when we understand 
the words of the prophets of God in this hour. And I'm talking about the biblical prophets, not the YouTube prophets. When we understand it, then seek his face with fasting and mourning. Sackcloth, ashes, uh, right? That's what it means. Verse 4. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. This is about God keeping his promises, his covenants. It always, the past and the future, whether we're talking about Jeremiah's prophecy, about the Babylonians, or the future, which is what Daniel's going to be told about. It's always about God keeping his promises and his covenants. And notice where he says, we have sinned. There, there are not any examples in the book of Daniel or any other book of the Bible what sins Daniel was guilty of. And yet, he opens the prayer for his people saying, we. Not they have sinned. But like Jeremiah himself, going back to him in uh, chapter 14 of his book, uh, verse 7, it says, The people say, Our wickedness is caught up with us, Lord, but help us for the sake of your own reputation. We have turned away from you and sinned against you again and again. O hope of Israel, our Savior in times of trouble. Who is the hope of Israel? Who is the Savior that they're crying for? Jesus, of course. Hope of Israel, our Savior in times of trouble, the great time of trouble, is coming as Jesus just told you. Why are you like stranger, a stranger to us? Why are you like a traveler passing through the land, stopping only for the night? Is our champion helpless to save us? We are right here among us. You are right here among us, Lord. Excuse me. We are known as your people. Please don't abandon us now. Daniel is identifying with the wicked, sinning people. This also is important. This also matters as a believer, as one who's grafted into Israel, as one who is supposed to be on their face, repentant, seeking God, seeking his face, seeking his word, seeking his every minute guidance and help, is that we are. We are guilty. We must repent. We are sinners. It's so easy, and we see it all the time. I see it all the time. You do too. Maybe you participate in it. Repent, friends. If we are participating in it's always the other guy's sins that we're pointing out, okay? That is not what God wants of you. We are guilty. Uh, verse 6. Neither, oh, sorry, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness, <laughs> excuse me, belongs to you. But to us, shame of face, as it is this day. This is Daniel speaking. He's saying, we have nothing but shame, no righteousness. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. So again, this is repeating the fact that Jeremiah's vision and prophecy was correct, and it is fulfilled. And the where, again, it's not um, generic or whatever. It's, it has to do with the nation of Israel, with the, the location of Judah, which has the city of Jerusalem, 
Yerushalayim in it, and of course, Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, and the building called the Temple, which houses the Holy of Holies. That's what it was about then, and that's what it will continue to be about. Verse 8, O Lord, to us, oh, I said that. Uh, no, it isn't. To, oh, Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. How often do we, I don't know, if if we're in a prayer you know, meeting for uh, the leadership of America or something, forgive me if you're not an American, you, you won't understand maybe, but so often we get into these prayer meetings and it's always forgive them even. Even when you're interceding, it's always them, 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 that party, those guys, these actions that we have nothing to do with over here because we're good. <sighs> to us belongs shame. Our kings, our princes, whether you voted for them or not, our fathers, I mean, our ancestors, because we have sinned against you, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God, to walk in his ways to which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. So he's testified. He's already told, warned you ahead of time. He warned Israel. He warned us. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law. And this is what the book of Romans says. This. All Israel has transgressed your law, including Daniel. He's part of Israel. And has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. You see exactly what Daniel's talking about. This is the curse of the law of Moses that is being poured out because they did not keep the law. Not a minor point. We Gentiles today think, oh, this is so his histor historical. It just doesn't mean anything to me. It better, because it ain't over. 12. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such as has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. That is a language that is looking forward. <laughs> Didn't Jesus just say never? It, and so terrible, so great this tribulation, it will never happen it's never happened in the past, and it will never happen again. That's how bad it will be. Here's a really key point, guys. Listen to this. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from, from our iniquities and understand your truth. Understand your truth is sechal. Sechal. Do you remember that? We'll touch on it in just a second when we're done with the prayer. But remember that word. Understand your truth. That we might turn for iniquity and understand. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Again, the plural and being inclusive in that is Daniel the prophet. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. What are we talking about here? Let's zoom in again. Your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. It's either Mount Moriah or Mount Zion. It's in Jerusalem and probably the Temple Mount because that's the other great topics of the Temple. Now, therefore... Our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, meaning himself, Daniel. Hear me, God. I am your servant, my supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine 
on your sanctuary, which is desolate. He's asking, when he says sanctuary, that's the temple, which is in ruins now. It's desolate. He's asking for the temple to be rebuilt and the Jews to return to it. Period. <laughs> that's it. Let your face shine upon that. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. And this is not America called by your name. <laughs> okay, this is Jerusalem. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Jerusalem is mentioned seven times in this prayer. Now watch this. Remember I said Shakal? Remember chapter one? We did this. Strong's Hebrew number 7919. Shakal, okay? The wise, when it says, understand my truth or your truth. The wise, gifted in all wisdom, they who understand. This is where the term Mahashkalim, Shakal is the middle of that. Those who understand, the wise. The wise, the wise virgins of Matthew 25. Shekha, the masculine. Daniel chapter 1, verse 4. Daniel chapter 1, verse 17. Daniel 9, which we just read, verse 13, and then again in 25, as we'll see. Verse uh, of chapter 11, verses 33 and 35, and chapter 12, verse 3 and 10. This is the, these are the points that God is pointing you to. If you are the masculine, if you are the ones, one of the ones who understands, if you are one of the wise, if you know and understand, let the reader understand. This is what Jesus is talking about. Zoom in on these verses. Zoom in on where we're at now. Listen. Listen carefully. Listen well. Because now comes the answer to his prayer. He gets this answer, friends, because he prayed. <laughs> because he prayed in humble submission and uh, inclusive um, admission of sin and wrongdoing. He didn't separate himself saying, ah, well, those other guys in Israel, they really messed up. We did this. We did this. Our fathers, our nation, our kings, etc., etc. Okay, so let's go back into the text. Verse 20. Now, while I was still speaking, praying and confessing my sin, my sin, and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Subject is not changing, right? Oops, forgot to bring the screen up for you, sorry. So while I was doing this, I was still talking, speaking, praying, confessing my sin and of Israel and before the holy mountain of my God. The request is rebuild the temple, God. Bring the my people, the Jews, Israel, back. For the holy mountain, again, has got to be Mount Moriah or perhaps Mount Zion, which means either it's Jerusalem generally or the temple specifically. I believe it's the temple, Mount Moriah, the holy mountain. So that's what he's praying for. All right. Now listen to this. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, Gabriel, Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly, reach me about the time of the evening offering. Wait a minute. What vision? Daniel didn't see a vision. He was praying. He didn't say anything. See anything. So what is he talking about? Well, 
uh, let's go back to the beginning of this chapter where it says this is the third year of Belshazzar. The date of the chapter. The third year of Belshazzar, or excuse me, the first year of Darius. The first year of Darius is the third year of Belshazzar because, as we read in Daniel chapter 5, verse 31, that very night the kingdom changed from Belshazzar of Babylon to Darius the Mede of Persia. Why does that make a difference? It's saying it's the same, could have been the same year. Meaning Daniel, what vision? Daniel 8. That's the vision he saw in the third year of Belshazzar. Go read the date of chapter 8. He saw a vision there, remember? Ram and the goat, all leading to how the Antichrist rises and the kingdom forms and the, and the caliphate, what we believe is the caliphate and the, you know, the final kingdom and all the machinations and all that stuff. Yeah, that vision. Gabriel showed up again. So it means, first of all, something at least interesting to me, which is that Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 were revealed in the same year, at, at the most, a year apart. Possibly only days apart. Chapter 9 has no vision in it. So it must be referring to the ram and goat. And maybe, maybe even the four beasts of chapter 7, which happened two years before that. Um, but the point is, Gabriel says, I'm helping you to... I'm going to help you do something with the... I saw the vision. What is this? All right, so pay attention. About the time of the evening offering. And he informed me... Or what does that mean, the evening offering? Uh, well, he came flying in quickly to reach Daniel by the evening offering. That's a time of day. First Chronicles 23.30 um, specifies that. Uh, there are two times of day where you would offer the sacrifices and pray. Uh, and then also see Daniel chapter 10, which we're going to get to perfectly next week. Um, anyways, so he came flying in at that time. And now, why? So he saw, he recognized Gabriel. He, he recognized this angel. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand the word give you skill to understand is shakal understand what i'm about to tell you this is the answer to your prayer at the beginning of your supplication the command went out and i have come to tell you the be the, the the very beginning of his prayer now we don't long, we don't know how long it lasted um, but immediately Gabriel was dispatched to give him a revelation of what? Of what he was praying for, which is what? I don't mean to be a first grade, you know, level of repetition, but about Jerusalem, the desolation of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the temple and the return of the Jews. That's the answer that he's going to get. He's praying for it to happen. So let's find out what the problem is or why are we getting a revelation? At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I've come to tell you because or for you are greatly beloved. Wow. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Understand the vision means what? Understand what you have seen already. The vision. What vision? The vision I saw in the beginning, as he just said. Daniel just said, Gabriel, the one I saw, right? The beginning of the, vi the vision at the beginning. That vision, here it is again. Understand the vision. Gabriel is not coming um, after a vision of chapter 9. Are we clear about this? Are we okay? Are we following along? There is no vision in chapter 9. 
he's giving a revelation to Daniel about chapter 8. And the answer, and maybe even 7, and the answer to that has to do with the temple in Jerusalem, the return of the Jews, and the desolation of Jerusalem. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, so understand the vision. By the way, um, even if you're saying, well, this is talking about Jeremiah's prophecy that Daniel referred to as understanding finally, that wasn't a vision either. He was just told by God, this is the deal. You're going to be, they're going to be gone for 70 years. No vision. All right, so let this, let's process this, okay? Let's really think about this. Let's pray on this. And here's the famous 70 weeks prophecy. 70 weeks, 70 periods of seven. Okay, that's why it's called a week. Shavua. Period of seven years are determined for your people and your holy city. What's your people? The Jews. Israel. What's your holy city? Jerusalem, right? Not very hard. And what about it? To finish. Now, I'm going to read a different translation here. To finish, it says, the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. It's their, not the, to finish their transgression your people, and for your city, 70 weeks are determined. That means that's the limit. The determination is the consummation, the end. There is a limit of 70 periods of seven years to finish Israel's transgression, to make an end of Israel's sins, their guilt. The entire 70 weeks, including the 70th, which is obviously still future to us today, is about Jacob. Is about Jacob, Israel's physical descendants, and their city, their city, Jerusalem. Right? God's city, yes. And he gave it to them to live in, the city of David, Jerusalem. And yes, Mount Zion, and yes, Mount Moriah, the temple, the holy place. 70 weeks to finish their sin and transgression, to make reconciliation for their iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. That's a mouthful. Everlasting perpetual righteousness. Uh, <laughs> look at Matthew 3.15. All right, let's take a look at that real quick. Matthew 3.15 is where John the Baptist and Jesus are having a little talk. And he says, I can't baptize you. I'm not worthy. And if I turn to it, we're going to find it. <laughs> uh, but John tried to talk him out. And I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, he says. So why are you coming to me? But then Jesus said, it should be done. For we must carry out all that God requires or to accomplish all righteousness that wasn't the end and bringing in for, perpetual means forever everlasting means forever really are the sins over and then there's nothing but righteousness in the world or even in jerusalem i don't think so was there ever everlasting righteousness when jesus was walking the earth in his city no So I think this is just, if you're looking at that as some type of fulfillment of this, be very, very careful. If anything, I think it means it's the opening of the door to whosoever will. In other words, the new covenant is now available while the king is in absentia. While the king is in absentia, while the king is in heaven awaiting to receive the kingdom, 
the door is open now. Whosoever will, Jew or Gentile, can come in under his righteousness. But it will only be enforced. The new covenant is not in violently, right? It's not imposed. It's not enforced. The rule of the king, King Jesus, is not enforced. It's a choice. But when he is actually in person in Jerusalem, then it will be perpetual, everlasting righteousness because he's on the ground. And that will only happen when the 70 weeks are over. All of them. What, again, look at the, there are now six different things listed there or finished when the 70 weeks end. Finish your people transgression their sins, reconciliation for iniquity, everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. That's six different things. That means all of those things cannot be done. They will not happen until the 70 weeks are over. All 70. Not 69, not 69 and a half, 70. Not before. When it says seal up vision and prophecy, don't, don't you know prophecy will end? Zechariah 13, 2 and 1 Corinthians 13, 8 says when there are prophecies, they will end. There will be a time where there will be no more prophecy because the Lord will be here. The time of looking forward to unfulfilled promises is done. It will be here, the guarantee of salvation. The salvation will be accomplished. The resurrection body will be delivered to those who believe, who are his children, right? That will end. That hasn't ended yet. To anoint the most holy. What is that? Some translations mean mean it to, um, or think it means the most holy one, to anoint the most holy one. Okay, again, there's the subtlety is, oh, it refers to the cross. No, it doesn't. Because King Jesus, Messiah Jesus, is crowned king in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, when he returns. This is the coronation, when you see the, the king on his glorious throne. Many, 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 many scriptures on this. That's when he's crowned the king. Only the seventh trumpet will the kingdoms of the earth become the kingdoms of the Lord and his Christ. We know this. But if it's referring to the most holy place, see the cleansing of the sanctuary because it's not holy. It's called the holy place, but until the day of the Lord, it won't be clean. See the cleansing of the sanctuary, Daniel 8, 14, right? There's a countdown on it. Well, yep, there's a temple, but there's still going to be 2,300 days now before it's clean, before it's cleansed. Well, how does that occur without Jesus on the earth? Le Leviticus 16.33. In other words, um, the Day of Atonement is being fulfilled at this time. This is the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement when Jesus cleanses the temple and takes his throne. When that most holy place is anointed. Anointed means Messiah, right? So when Messiah Jesus is crowned, then... At, at the end of the 70th week, at the end. Verse 25. I think that's all I want to say about 24. Um, oh, one more note. The angle that it's actually referring to the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary in Leviticus 16. Also, there's a tie-in to chapter 12 of Daniel. Um when there's that super mysterious ending, when the angel, maybe Gabriel himself, is saying, well, we don't know the day of the hour because blessed is he who waits with the 1290 to the 1335 days. Just kind of, wow, that's random. Well, maybe it's not. All right, just keep that uh, in your prayer closet. All right, now, verse 25, here we go. Know therefore and understand, wise one, 
that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, then 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. No one understand. This is what the masculine or the wise virgins must know. The entire 70 weeks prophecy. The entire one. That's why I called, we're calling this the master prophecy because the wise, the masculine, must know the whole darn thing. It's not enough to say, well, I'm, you know, the 70th week is all I really understand. Or the, the last half of the 70th week is all I really understand. Or the, the cross is at the end of the 69th week. That's all I really understand. Or whatever. Not good enough. So what does it say when it says 62 weeks and then seven or, or one one set of seven and then 62? 69 total. That's all it means. Is a period of seven in the beginning and then 62 after that. What does that equal? 69. From the command to rebuild until Messiah. 69 total weeks. This is important because it's exact timing. This I don't want to get into it really, but this is why Jesus would excoriate um, the Pharisees and those, the scribes, those who should know, because they've been copying and studying Daniel for hundreds of years. And he's saying, guys, I already told you this. I, you know when you know who I am. You should know because it's exact to the date. Daniel gave you the date. Even the wise men, the, the Magi from Persia, who came over and said, well, we know because this is the star of the anointed one. This is the star of the Moshiach. We know he's to be born now, and we know he's to be born in Israel because we have the book of Daniel. We, this is, we know the timing. If God is God, then he's not going to be wrong about this. Some Messiah has to be here. Some anointed one is here because this is the date, and this is the location, and the star led us right here. So, yeah, Jesus has a real good reason to question what the heck the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and all you rulers in Jerusalem, what are you thinking? Even Herod had the, the guts to ask, hey, where is he supposed to be born again? Wasn't the, isn't this the time? Isn't this the timing? Granted, he didn't act well on it, on the information, okay, but... At least he asked. At least he said, well, oh, maybe this, this is it then. Um, one more note on verse 25. Uh, Jerusalem will be, what when it say moat and, you know, uh, walls and all that stuff, it means it has strong defenses, right? When you build a city and it has high walls and it has, a, a you know, a water around it, this is all to defend the city. So I'm reading it to say it's going to have strong defenses to withstand trouble even through the coming Greek and Roman empires, which it did. It did, and it stood all the way through Jesus' time and the Romans themselves, all the way till 70 AD, right? Now, I think it means even more than that. So let's go to verse 26. After, and after the 62 weeks, and the 62 happened after the seven, right? You can't just put them down in the beginning and confuse stuff. Seven first, then 62. So what it's saying is, after the 69th week, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Or another translation, which I think is better, saying, appearing to have or accomplishing nothing. The phrase not for himself really is not good. It's not accurate appearing to have nothing, cut off, dead. Messiah be killed. Well, we don't want to hear that. And the people of the prince who is to come, by the way, didn't it look to, uh, to those who didn't know who Jesus really was and the, what the scriptures really said about his mission and about that he must die and that he must rise again and 
open the doors up to the nations to come into the kingdom of Israel. If you didn't know that, you were looking for a warrior. You wanted the lion before the lamb. Oh, uh, it looks like he had nothing. He died empty handed, literally. No kingdom, no victory. In fact, he had complete defeat. It looked to all the world, even to the principalities and powers and Satan himself, that they won. They crucified the Lord of glory. Yes, they're saying, whew, we stopped the plan of God. Side note, no, they didn't. Uh, God didn't change his plans. God didn't do plan B. God didn't do some kind of trick. He just did what he said he was going to do all along. But they just couldn't understand because the darkness does not comprehend the light. Doesn't understand that you need to suffer, you need to give up your flesh, that you need to die on a cross. And Jesus bid us to come and die as well. The world doesn't understand that. Even some, many Christians today don't understand that. The victory is in your death, in the death of Christ crucified. And the resurrection that he has already experienced is coming for us in the future, in the kingdom, when it comes. Okay. Um, Messiah is killed, having appearing to have nothing or accomplished nothing after the 69th week. It is, guys, it's just so important to realize this. It's at some level, it's common sense. Why would anyone think otherwise? But I'm telling you, there was a huge industry for 2,000 years denying this plain fact. Jesus died at the end of the 69th week, right? That's what it says. Not in the middle of the next week. Not in the 70th. That distinction is vital, friends, uh, to avoid deception. Messiah shall be cut off in the people of the prince who is to come. Now that's in juxtaposition to what you just read, Messiah the Prince. Then he's dead. Then the people of the Prince who is to come. Different Prince, okay? Now, I don't care what the translation you're in. This is a different person. It can't be the same person. Messiah is the one, and this other one is another one. And distinction number two, it's not only the Prince who is to come, who's a different person, which it is, but the people of the Prince who is to come, shall destroy the city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, the temple. The end of it, kind of awkward sentence, shall be with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Okay, so sit there for a second. The people of the coming prince, not the coming prince himself, number one, the people of him did destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Well, if we're looking at 70 AD, and I think we should, at, at least as an exercise, realize, and those of you who studied this with people who we track with, will know that the temple in 70 AD was not destroyed by the Romans. What? What are you talking about, brother? No, it wasn't. It was not destroyed by ethnic Romans. The Roman general was in charge of an operation, but the history of it is he even tried to stop them from destroying the temple. They didn't want to be known as those guys. They had a bad history. They didn't want to be Babylon. The people who actually destroyed the temple, we know from histories, are Syrians and Arabs, not Romans. That matters. Why would why would Daniel even put, why would God why would Gabriel the angel even put that detail in there if it didn't matter why would he say the people of the prince to come why why didn't he just say and but the, this word people is like ethnic group like a nation like a gentile matters all right number two so it wasn't destroyed by Romans and this coming prince is not Messiah the prince which we just said okay. Easy, should be very easy. 
But the very least, it means this, that the coming prince is not in history. Why? Because he's mentioned again in the next verse multiple times. So the coming prince is a future character. It's incredibly irresponsible and a little crazy to put this coming prince in 70 AD or at any time before the culmination of these things. Where it says, let's look at where it says, and its end will be with a flood or desolations. Let's go back to Jeremiah again. Jeremiah chapter 4, uh, verse 20 to 22. Let's just read that real quick now that I'm looking at it or near it. And we're almost done here, guys, but I think it's worth it. Jeremiah 4, 20. My heart, my heart, I writhe in pain. That's 19. My heart pounds within me. I cannot be still, for I have heard the blast of enemy trumpets and the roar of their battle cries. Waves of destruction roll over the land until it lies in complete desolation. Suddenly my tents are destroyed. In a moment my shelter's crushed. How long must I see the battle flags or hear the trumpets of war? My people are foolish and do not know me says the Lord, they are stupid children who have no understanding. They are clever enough at doing wrong, but they have no idea how to do right. Jerusalem and the issue of Jerusalem and the temple is a constant cause of strife, controversy, and war, even till today. Now look at Isaiah 28, 18 in the NASB 20, which is the most recent NASB translation. Your rulers of Jerusalem, your covenant with death shall be canceled. And your pact with Sheol will not stand. When the gushing flood passes through, you will become its trampling ground. Its end will be with a flood. When the flood passes through, you will become its trampling ground, so it will drown you. What? That's interesting. So that means that's the end until the end of the war. The end of the war is the end of the 70th week. The flood comes at the end, which is this. Verse 27, then he, the prince to come, shall confirm a covenant with the many for one week seven years but in the middle of the week three and a half years in he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate um all right let's bring in another screen here because that's kind of awkward all right even in that version By the way, if you have any questions or comments, you can go ahead and ask them. I hope we have time for it. Verse 27, he will make the covenant or confirm a covenant or a treaty for one seven. In other words, the final seven years begins with this covenant or treaty. How do we know the seven years have begun? How do we know the 70th week of Daniel? Daniel just told you. He will do this. The final seven years begins with a covenant or treaty, no matter what else it may be. And people have had controversies about this and arguments and the stupid, stupid arguments. For what? No matter what else it may be, what it must be, it must involve the coming prince, right? He will make or confirm the covenant. Must involve the coming prince and the leaders of Israel, because that's where the covenant is made, Isaiah 28. The leaders of you people in Jerusalem. And just like the rest of this chapter has to do with the temple. The temple mount, the area where the first two temples stood. Yes, it did, Mount Moriah, both of them. And where the third one will stand, same place. This 
agreement, treaty, covenant, whatever, must, must, must be done by the coming prince and no other, involve Jerusalem and no other place, and the temple and no other issue. Do we understand that? Because every time there's a silly negotiation or some kind of deal with Israel or some kind of uh, meeting with the Pope and an imam or something, people go crazy. This hasn't happened, okay? There is no way that anyone's pointing to this as being fulfilled. Until you see this, it's not. But this is the point of the masculine. This is the point of God telling us this. This is when shakal, this is what it's about. This is when we learn to understand because we're supposed to know before the great sign. What's the great sign in all this? Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's the great sign. But guess what? Up to this point, we've seen in this chapter nothing but signs before. This prophecy contains up to this point everything before the abomination. So it must involve, the beginning of this period must involve Jerusalem, the leaders of Israel, the Temple Mount, and this man of sin, this final one, this coming prince. The many, when it says covenant made with many, it may be the Jewish people, meaning all of Israel. It could. Or it could mean the ten kings that the prince, this coming prince, will speak for them. Remember, we know Revelation, we know other scriptures in Daniel. This little horn, this, this coming one, will speak for ten nations, ten kings united as one kingdom. Could That could be the many that it's talking about. Or just those surrounding nations and mass, those populations of those ten uh, kings who they represent. Okay, so no matter how you slice it, the two parties represented are Israel on one side and the surrounding nations on the other side. That's the covenant. That's the treaty. That's the agreement. And guess what? You need that because the Temple Mount issue will never, ever be resolved any other way. The Muslim world must agree to it. Must agree to it because they control the Temple Mount now. Believe it or not. Anyways, point is, who are the many? It's one of those things, but here's either way, it's the same result. It, if if anyone, this really gets me because you have prophecy students who get all this way and then turn around and say, "Is can't this this refers to Jesus? This covenant with the many is the the cross. It cannot refer to Jesus and the cross." First of all, different prince, okay? He's the coming prince, not the Messiah, the prince. It's a different week because we know Jesus died at the end of the 69th week. This is the middle of the 70th week. And the new covenant was never seven years long. How in the world? How in the world? Yeah, we say this is the covenant that Jesus brought in. How dare you say that? How dare we say that? Moving on. And we'll get to um, treason here. It says, what do the wings of abominations mean? I'll get to that. I think right here. In the middle of the week, he ends the sacrifices. In the middle of this seven-year period, he, the prince to come, ends the sacrifices. That means the temple must be rebuilt. Has to be. There's no other way. All the language here is extremely simple. It's extremely repetitious. Just like the second temple, just like in the first temple, it'll be a third temple. And I'm sorry, just because we have disagreements with certain of our brothers um, on this rapture issue or whatever, doesn't mean you, they got it all wrong. Because this is part is right. There does have to be a third temple. It does have to be a covenant between Israel and the surrounding nations. And it will be broken three and a half years in. But if he stops the sacrifices, that means they have to be started. Before that, duh. So it means the temple must be rebuilt. Sacrifices must be restarted. There is no underground temple sacrifices. There is no secret temple sacrifices. Stop this. If anyone's on this kick, okay? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter red heifers who was born today. It doesn't matter what they've got ready to do or permission to go pray. None of this is this. 
It will be public. It will be agreed upon by all the nations. And then he stops it. That also means the wise have work to do, doesn't it, during the first three and a half years? Because why? We know it's coming. It's not enough just to say, well, I know what's going to happen and do nothing about it for three and a half years. And here, on the wing of abominations, better translated as at, the, this is the NIV, says, at the temple, he, the coming prince, the prince to come, at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Whoop, there's Jesus' words. Or the CSB translation, also very good. The abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple. That's when it says the wing of abomination. What's the wing of the temple? See Matthew 4, verse 5, when it says Satan took Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple. A pinnacle is a wing. When it says the wing of the temple, it means the pinnacle, it means the highest point, it means the corner. I've been there. I've been on the ground, standing up, looking up at that pinnacle of the temple where the enemy of our souls took the Lord Jesus Christ and told him to jump down. The angels will save you. That's the same place the abomination will be placed. Satan's plans were revealed, even back then. Even to when he challenged Jesus to do this and that, it was not for no reason. He knew exactly why. He knew exactly what he wanted to do, and he's going to do it in the end. even unto the consummation. The consummation means the ending, the official uh, or the official beginning, right? If you consummate your marriage, okay, I don't have to go into the description on that. It means now it's official. It is done. Okay, the ceremony is over. The courtship is done. The marriage has started, right? The end, the end of the war, verse 26. Remember, till the end of the war, desolations are determined. This is the end, even to the consummation. This is it. Uh, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20. What does that say? I forget. <laughs> I think this chapter is very valuable, actually. Um, very slippery Bible tonight. All right. Uh, 10, 20 to 25. In that day, the remnant left in Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob will no longer depend on allies who seek to destroy them. But they will faithfully trust in the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return. Yes, the remnant of Jacob will return at the end. But through the people of Israel, though the people of Israel are as numerous as the sand of the seashore, only a remnant will return. The Lord has rightly decided to destroy those people. Yes, the Lord of Heaven's armies has already decided to destroy the entire land. So this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. O oh, my people in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian when they oppress you with rod and club as the Egyptians did long ago, just a little while longer, and my anger against you will end. Then my anger will rise up to destroy them. Judgment must begin at the house of God first. It's true of the church. It's true of Israel. Then the enemies of God experience his wrath. The Lord of heaven's armies will lash them with his whip as he did when Gideon triumphed over the Midianites at the rock of Oreb when the Lord's staff was raised to drown the Egyptian army in the sea. The greater exodus is coming. Verse 27 again says, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator is the right way to translate that, not the desolate the desolate, the desolator, the one who did the desolation, the coming prince. The coming prince's destruction, the creed end is poured out on him. It's Daniel chapter 11, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, right? 
what happens? The evil one, the one of Satan, the one who does the work of the devil, he will be destroyed by the coming of Jesus. He will be killed by the brightening of, brightness of his coming. That's the decreed end of the desolator. Here's the bottom line, guys. The answer to Daniel's prayer is the most specific prophecy ever given by God. Period. There's a lot of God saying, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, even uh, after, you know, in this particular place, this particular person will come, This a lot of that, no doubt, very, very specific, but never has it been this specific. Never has he said, this many years, Messiah will come, period, the end. And then in the final seven years, this is exactly what will happen in the beginning, in the middle of it, and at the end. The wise must understand it all. What I'm saying is waiting to the last three and a half years to take action on this knowledge is not acceptable. It's not acceptable to God. Not acceptable to me. It's not acceptable to leaders who have seen the vision of the Lord. Guys, you've all seen it. You've all seen it tonight. That means you're responsible now. Note. Just finally on this subject, because it always seemed to come up. It is critical, critical, critical to know and teach the wise, the wise, the masculine, the wise virgins. We must know and teach that the coming prince and his covenant that is made, then broken with Israel, is not Jesus and has nothing to do with the new covenant, ending the sacrificial system for believers. It is satanic i'm i'm sorry i believe this to my core it is satanic to assign the coming works of the antichrist to jesus satanic please run from anyone who tries to assign the work of the devil and the antichrist to jesus get out rebuke that one are you crazy man don't do that do not say that Daniel 9.27 refers to Jesus. Wow. Okay. Everyone loves a chart, right? And I know we're taking a while to get here, but here it is. This, to me, this is the... I'm not a chart guy. And actually, you see the background of this uh, image tonight. I'll make it bigger here.
Okie dokies. Um, I'm seeing we have signal problems. So we may have an issue concluding here. Hope not. But let's see if there's any questions or comments at the endtime.church. Um, yeah, the picture and things keep keep whipping on and off that's the that's the weather you guys i'm sorry um okay i'm just looking for questions uh you can always rewind this by the way it'll work fine there won't be a, a hiccup which is cool um christ said he would be with us always that's what he says um the chart oh no not the chart we lost that all right, let me let's see if I can bring that up. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, any questions? Treason says, do you think the 10 kings have to actual kings? In other words, have to be actual kings as in a monarch rather than a president? No. No. It just means leader. Um, it just means leader. So leader of the country however that term is i mean it could don't get me wrong it's not like it's impossible um but to say well this can't be it because these these are 10 prime ministers and presidents and 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 uh imams uh versus the word king uh don't be tripped up by that it just means leaders of the countries um The day of the Lord refers to the rapture. The day of the Lord refers to the return of Jesus. Um, and part of that, like Paul would say in 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, is the day of the Lord does not come before the abomination of desolation, and it does not come before the great falling away, and it does not come before the Lord Jesus returns to kill the Antichrist. So the gathering to Christ, what we have come to call the rapture the gathering to christ is the seventh trumpet we are told that specifically first corinthians 15 it is the last trumpet the last trumpet is the seventh trumpet the one where the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of jesus christ there is no separate date uh, the day of the lord is the gathering to christ when we given our resurrection bodies just like he has we see him as he is and he comes in wrath all the same time Um, comments disappearing oh no can't have that all right let's try to pull this uh chart up for those who didn't see it that's always fun okay Reggie Kelly again is the author, although he's not, he hasn't signed it or anything like that, uh, or digitally said where it belongs. So. That's it. Um, how's that? <laughs> it's it's long and big and kind of hard to see. Uh, but that's that's it. And everything fits right in. Again, um, as I was saying at that time when I showed this picture the first time, there is there is literally no other chart, end time chart ever, ever, that I could say, yep, I think this is right. I think it's 100% accurate. Uh, I think it's scriptural, and that's it. No opinions, no uh, traditions or whatever. It's just what the scripture says is coming. Well, this is a good one. So keep this in mind. Reggie Kelly is an absolute gem and one of the great teachers on earth, period. He knows the heart of God. He's got the uh, love of Israel. He's got the, the heart posture that God is after. I mean, it's he's really phenomenal, in my opinion. We've asked him to be on the end time church, but he's not uh, responded positively yet. Not negatively either. I mean, I'm friends with him on Facebook, but Lord willing, one day. But anyway, that's his chart, okay? 
All right. Um, I think we should go. Um, uh, let me give you that link as well. It was in, I'm sorry, I posted it earlier. And the End Time Church app, by the way, has this link already. If you have the app, go get it. No, if you don't have the app, go get it. And here's the link. Copy and paste. First for the ETC webpage and then for YouTube and Facebook. Okay, there it is. Um, Gene says the reference to the evening prayer in Daniel 9 shows the posture of Daniel's heart I believe there were no sacrifices in captivity correct but Daniel remembered in his heart faithful to God very good point and um, like the reference I think we gave was in 2nd uh, Chronicles where obviously there was a temple and Solomon um, and all that stuff so Yes, good point. Very good. Treason. Can First Corinthians really refer to the seventh trumpet? Of course. When John wrote Revelation decades after, yep. You know why? Uh, Joshua chapter se uh, six. Can the last trumpet refer to other trumpets? No. No, because God isn't trying to. I mean, I know what you're saying. I know where the theory that you're getting at is. And no, it's complete bunk because. Um, God is not trying to confuse you. If he meant there were more than seven, he would say there's more than seven. He would put it in Revelation. He would put it in some other book of the New Testament. He's not expecting us to go to some obscure, um, you know, something that's not plain. Write it plain on tablets. Make it plain so that the wise can hear and run. There, there's no, no, there's seven. And it's not just Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. The trumpet of God, he calls it, right? I mean, there's the, 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 in the Old Testament, the prophets are talking about the trumpet and the gathering of Israel. It's all the same time. So, yes, the seventh is the last. It means the furthest one out. It means nothing can happen after the seventh. There are no trumpets after the seventh trumpet. God's not trying to mess with your mind, fool you, confuse you, or scare you. He's given you all the information, plain as day. And yes, even in the book of Joshua, right, with the seven priests at the seven trumpets and went around the city seven times and the walls fell down, seven trumpets. No more than seven. That's the war time. That's the revelation time. That's the end of Babylon, all that stuff. Okay? So yes, Paul knew there were seven. And by the way, he was taken to the third heaven, so he knew. There's no, new, there's no special secret information, secret sauce. Um. All right, all right. So yes, we got to get over the this whole rapture thing. It's dumb. Uh, guys, we love you. Um, and by the way, very Mark Davidson. Thank God for you, man. I owe you a phone call because God has been telling me to call you. Um. Last trumpet in Matthew twenty four twenty nine thirty one. Yes, right at the end after the tribulation, God will send his angels at the sound of the trumpet and will gather his elect for the four winds. Hello, hello. Completely consistent, right? There's not there's not one inconsistency. There's not one hidden thing that God's trying to mess you up with or trip you up. It's just all in there and it's very simple. All right, friends, it is too late. We've been going on a long, long time. I apologize for that. We had to get through it. And uh, next week, Lord willing, be back for chapter 10. It's a great book of Daniel. I hope you learned something from it. If we've blessed you, please bless us. Endtime.church slash give. Uh, get the free app and tell folks about this church. Because, yes, it's a legitimate church. I'm an ordained minister of the gospel and a pastor. Uh, Christopher Anderson is as well. As, uh, pastor Randy's on staff here. I mean, we've got, this is a church for real, guys. So support it like one. And uh, we love you so much. Until next time. Uh, for Taryn and Chris and all our beautiful friends uh, around the world. Praise Jesus. Exalt him. Make sure you take up your cross, guys. We can't do it. Like Daniel showed us, we cannot do it any other way. We've got to be on our face. We've got to be in mourning and, and repentant and even of our sins as a people, as a nation, as a church.
get to that posture, uh, and then we're going to get some real help from God. All right, bless you all.